A higher authority, Pope Francis, is headed for an historic trip to Cuba and the U.S. and already making an impact. You bear direct responsibility for the murders carried out with the dollars you have given them. The Iran nuclear deal looks like a go, but with what political fallout, especially in South Florida? I'm obviously younger. You're younger. Uh -huh. Much better looking. Uh -huh. A late night comedian gets Jeb Bush to say what political journalists have not, and that is just one of the topics we take to the roundtable. Good morning and welcome. Great to be with you today. Michael is off today. A big week ahead in the political world and in the spiritual world, and the two will be colliding in Cuba and in U.S. cities where Pope Francis is getting ready to visit. Some 200 people from South Florida will be traveling to pray with the Pope, a religious leader achieving rock star status for his defining moves on difficult issues. How will he handle issues like human rights and human suffering when he meets with the Cuban and U.S. lawmakers whose governments he helped to connect in secret diplomacy? We put that question and more to Archbishop Thomas Wensky, who is leading the local pilgrimage to Havana later this week. Archbishop, thank you so much for being with us on the eve of your trip. I want to start out with news that broke late in the week. The Cuban government has decided to pardon some 3,500 prisoners. And um, from what I've been reading, this has been done before previous papal visits. So I wanted to get your perspective and your sort of analysis on what that means. Well, again, as you said, it was done before. So I think it's a goodwill gesture. And certainly it's something that's welcomed by the church and certainly especially welcomed by the families of those uh, of those prisoners. And, uh, you know, uh, would that we would do something similar here in the United States because we certainly have a lot of people incarcerated in this country and uh, and uh, I know in, in Congress there are some efforts to reform s sentencing guidelines and there's a lot of people that are incarcerated today in our country that don't need to be in uh, and certainly could be reunited with their families as well. And I want to talk a little bit about the Pope's U.S. trip mm -hmm. as well a little bit later in a couple of minutes but uh, the, the prisoners just uh, for anyone who hasn't heard yet are those who are going to be released on humanitarian um, right. for and, reasons elderly and, children but not but not political. Not what they prisoners. call political right. prisoners. And, and we would hope that there would be some uh, welcome announcement in that area uh, sometime soon as well. Do you know, is the Pope going to be addressing any sort of human rights issues? Will he be meeting with dissidents during his three days in Cuba? I don't know if he's going to be meeting with dissidents uh, in Cuba, uh, but what he would say to them is, I'm sure, the same thing he's going to be saying publicly in Cuba. And in fact, the Pope has already met with dissidents. Uh, 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 Oswaldo Payas' family uh, went to Rome last May and met with the Pope, and he spent, I think, about 20 minutes with him, with them. Uh, also, I believe some ladies in white uh, that had left Cuba made their way to Rome and also had an opportunity to uh, speak with the Pope. So the Pope is, uh, is, is well aware of the situation on the island. And, uh, and he'll be addressing the issues of human rights just like the previous popes did when they went to the island. Um, um, so I think, uh, you know, uh, the pope is not a very shy person. He says what's on his mind, and uh, I think he'll speak his mind in Cuba. It was our understanding that Berta Soler, who is the head of the ladies in white, had, mm -hmm. had actually requested a meeting mm -hmm. with the pope. Um, there have been, in prior papal visits, crackdowns by the Cuban government on people like the ladies in white and people that they call dissidents. Is, is the Pope, are you afraid that that might happen in advance of this trip? Uh, it certainly could happen because it did happen uh, during Pope Benedict's trip, uh, perhaps less so with John Paul II's trip, but uh, uh, you know the government uh, made sure that certain people could not make it to the papal mass. Hopefully this will not be repeated again and, uh, and that uh, uh, the Pope will be able to speak with everybody in Cuba. And, uh, and, and again, uh, the Pope goes to Cuba as a missionary of mercy 
and I believe his message is one that everyone needs to hear. Let's talk about the trip a little bit. This is, you know, you know now the, the world knows that Pope Francis was instrumental in brokering the new relationship between the U.S. and Cuba. And that's and what both uh, President Obama and Raul Castro said. And uh, I think uh, because of that, the Cuban people in Cuba will welcome him with great uh, joy and great uh, gratitude because uh, that uh, uh, that announcement on December 17th uh, brought about renewed hope in Cuba across the board on in every level of Cuban society. Uh, so I think uh, you know when John Paul II went to Cuba 18 years ago uh, to prepare for that visit, the church had to explain to a lot of Cubans who uh, did not know much about the church because the church was very marginalized, what a pope was. Now, now the third pope in less than 20 years going to Cuba, the Cuban people, whether they go to church or not, know what a pope is, but they also know who this pope is. There, the Catholic Church in Cuba, it, in the course of those 20 years, is really, and correct me if I'm wrong, is really the one individual organization in civil society that has independence, or at least mm -hmm. the kind of independence that no other group there really, organized group really knows. And the church has always maintained that sense of that independence in Cuba as it tries to do in other countries uh, uh, because uh, it's, you know, the old uh, give to God what is God, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but uh, even Caesar is under God. But so the church has maintained its independence and has suffered a lot in, in, in Cuba because of that. But in recent years, it's been able to uh, regain space and have a more public presence and, and certainly influencing uh, events on the island. Uh, so it's all good. It's uh, the relationships uh, between the church and the state are better than the, what they used to be. Uh, there's probably not as good as they should be because the church wants the freedom to 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 act uh, uh, in, in her role as an evangelist evangelizer and to, and to uh, do its mission without uh, uh, without you know uh, discrimination or or uh, restrictions. Sure, and uh, Cuban Cardinal Jaime Ortega has, I'm sure. A a fine line to walk in, in getting that done. I'm wondering if you think the dialogue and the relations, growing relations between the church and Cuba might be a blueprint for growing dialogue between the United States and Cuba. Well, again, I, uh, the church has always stood in favor of dialogue and uh, respectful dialogue. And, and, and that's where you can hope to make some progress. Uh, when the Pope goes to Cuba, I think he'll emphasize that uh, as a missionary of mercy. He's going to tell the Cubans, uh, you know, uh, give your brother, give your sister your heart and not an insult or not a stone. And, and I think uh, uh, we need to uh, have that uh, culture of encounter that the Holy Father has been talking about ever since he's been Pope that uh, we have to have this culture of encounter because it's in that encounter that we can discover our common humanity and, and hopefully find a path to overcome the obstacles that, that divide us. The Pope is uh, part of the uh, description of a Pope is to be a pontifex which is a Latin word which means bridge builder. And so the Pope has been trying to build bridges over, over some very significant walls. Bridge building, I think, is part of the, the Pope's job description. That's right. Let's sit tight for one second. We're going to take a quick break, and we will come right back. Welcome back. We are speaking with Miami Archbishop Thomas Wenske. So glad to have you with us on a what, what will be a Sunday morning. Of course, we are taping this early because you have a big travel schedule ahead of you. And tell me about the pilgrimage. You have, what, 200 people going with you uh, to Cuba? Uh, 200 plus, I guess, uh, uh, be, uh, people going to Cuba with uh, the Miami delegation as a, again, as you said, it's a pilgrimage. Uh, and I'll be reminding them that uh, we're going not as tourists, but as pilgrims. And uh, what, what does that mean, practically? Well, I think tourists, you know, tourists want to be catered to. And uh, pilgrims, we have to travel light and leave 
you know, leave the heavy baggage behind. It's a and, it will be a religious that's experience. Right. It's, it's certainly going to be a religious experience. Our, our travel to Cuba is built around the Pope's itinerary. And, uh, and we want to stand in solidarity with the Catholic Church in Cuba. Archbishop, you come from a community where there is contention, yes, but in internally for many people here, there is a push and pull over going or not going, mm -hmm. spending money in Cuba, not spending money. Mm -hmm. What your pilgrims, your 200 travelers, what have you experienced with them? Well, I can talk about uh, in 2012, I did a similar pilgrimage uh, for the Pope, uh, Pope Benedict's trip to Cuba. And at that time, I brought, uh, as I'm going, as this time, many many Cuban Americans, and some of them going back to Cuba for the first time, and the fact that they were going in a pilgrimage uh, made it easier for them to go back because traveling with the church sort of created like a safe bubble, you know, that uh, where they could go back and and, and with honor and and, and all that, and, but at the same time, they're going to Cuba uh, for that mass, that papal mass, and they're being in Cuba was for most of them, if not all of them, a very healing experience. And I think that's uh, really what a lot of the pilgrims are hoping for when they go now to Cuba once again to greet the successor of St. Peter, uh, who goes to strengthen his brother bishops in the faith and to witness to the joy of the gospel in a, in a country that needs a lot of joy and needs some reason for hope. Yes. I want to turn to the Pope's visit to the U.S. following the Cuba trip. Um, Washington first, New York, and then Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. We have crews that will be along for every minute of right. the way there. I know you'll be in all of those places. The One of the highlights to the Washington trip is going to be the Pope's address to Congress. Right. And I wonder, I know the Catholic Church has been longtime vocal opponents of the U.S. embargo on Cuba. Is that going to be addressed in that speech? Well, I don't know if, uh, if the Pope is going to address specific policy issues, but you know, the Pope uh, likes to make uh, gestures that are very symbolic. And so even the fact that he's traveling to Washington from Cuba is a symbolic gesture. We talked about him being a bridge builder, and he's building an air bridge, if you will, between Cuba and, and Washington on this trip. So I think that's going to speak volumes. Uh, he's going to address the joint session of Congress. That's going to be a very important address, first time in history that a pope has addressed the joint session of Congress. Uh, like I said, I don't know if he's going to get in the nitty gritty of policy issues, but uh, he's already, uh, you know, set out some major themes uh, since he became pope that I think he will raise with the Congress. He's talked about uh, the globalization of indifference. He's talked about this throwaway culture in which we uh, we dispose of even people, you know, especially vulnerable people. He's talked about uh, the the despair of young people across the world, and even in this you know, in, in the United States, where they don't have any uh, solid job prospects uh, for to organize their lives and to and to establish families. He's talked about you know the great inequalities, uh, environmental degradation. Um, you know he's talked about the pollution of our waterways, but also about the pollution of our hearts through uh, through a lot of uh, you know. Uh, 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 you know, dirty stuff. Sure, and you know what's so interesting, I think, for anybody watching, is that he, here is a leader of a flock of people, but the world is taking notice of what Francis, Pope Francis says. People all over the world sit up and take notice. He is, you use the word outspoken, he's yeah. out there. And he has a rock star setting, quality about him, but he's a rock star. And in such a lovable way. And with substance as and well. with substance, right. yeah. Why has Pope Francis never been to the United States before? Why is this his first trip? Well, when uh, he became Pope, he, he, he warned bishops about not becoming airport bishops. Uh, people that, uh, you know, spend a lot of time in airports going to places other than their place that they're uh, that they are supposed to be uh, working at uh, so I think uh, in that sense uh, you know he, he stayed close to home he of course has traveled he, he went to Italy several times as a cardinal you have to go to Italy he studied in Germany uh, but uh, he, he was much more of a homebody 
And I, you know, I, I understand what he's saying because too, you know, often uh, I have to travel for responsibilities with the bishops' conference, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, you know, so you know, it's a something that one has to pay attention to. That your your main, you know, your main task is to take care of your parishioners. But now the pope is pope, and so his parish parishes the world, and so he's in an airplane perhaps more than he would like to be. Has he? What kind of preparation has he done for the U.S. trip? Uh, Culturally speaking, what did he want to know? Ah, uh, that's a good question, and uh, nobody asked me to give him any information. But I uh, and I will be at uh, this week. I'll be going to the bishops conference in the United States for our our, our uh, late summer meetings, and uh, perhaps I'll get some insight then. But I know that the. Uh, Usually, in the preparation of such visits, they, uh, the Holy See would would uh, uh, seek sound out uh, the bishops conference and and check with uh, different uh, people that they that they have of confidence. Arch uh, Cardinal Worrell of Washington D.C. certainly, uh, Cardinal O'Malley of Boston also. Yeah. So uh, I think he has he, he'll he'll know how to talk to people that have their pulse on what's happening in this country, and. Again, he'll come, and he'll come with that, uh, with that smile, and that uh, uh, that smile that radiates joy. And he's going to give us a message, uh, a mess, and he'll probably challenge us as well. But in in that in that challenge, he's going to he's he's going to remind us that uh, you know the invitation to follow Christ is a, is is not a burden, but it's a gift, and it's a gift that generates great joy. And he wants. Uh, Catholics, in particular Christians in general, not to be sour pusses. Let's let's uh, broaden that out to, to everybody. But to be joyful and to communicate that joy. It is going to be a fascinating couple of weeks on a lot of levels. So appreciative that you are here with us to give us a preview and uh, it's safe, a pleasure to be here. Safe travels. Thank you. And before our conversation there, the Archbishop was in the newsroom. He was testing out some jokes and some riddles. He's tooling up for an appearance with late night comedian Stephen Colbert when he's with the Pope in New York. And do you know who's been there and done that already? Jeb Bush. And that is one of the topics we take to the round table. And that is next. We have a lot to cover on the roundtable today, so let's get right to the introductions. Justin Safey is a veteran in state politics who publishes SafeyReview.com. That is a go-to website for political news. Mark Caputo covers Florida politics for Politico, the go-to website for political news, too. Marlon Hill is an attorney with the Hamilton Miller and Berthesel firm, also a radio broadcaster. And welcome for the first time on the round table, Marcus Bright, executive director of Education for a Better America and also an adjunct professor of public administration at Lynn University. Welcome, everybody. Morning. Great to be here. It's been Morning. a big week of news. Shana <laughs> Shana Tova to you. Happy New Year to everybody. Thank you. Um, I want to start with uh, a little bit about the Pope's trip to not only Cuba, but the U.S. I know, Marlon, you were saying that you're hearing a lot from the people you hang out with and what they want to hear when the Pope comes, and especially in his address to Congress. Well, you know, as a former acolyte and altar server, the, the little altar server in me, you know, the Pope is a very important person in our lives. You know, this, this has been a very special Pope to us. He's bringing us back to basic values that, you know, everyone across the world should be caring about economic justice, um, talking about, he was the bishop of the slums you know, in Buenos Aires, um, in Argentina. He's talking about issues that all of us at the dinner table should be talking about. So when he takes that message to Cuba and he comes to the United States and Philly and New York and D.C., and of course before Congress, um, he'll be bringing those values with him. You know, it, it's so interesting as the Archbishop will be the first to tell you that this is not a political man. This is a spiritual man. But the Catholic well, Church is the biggest political organization. Boy, has he moved the needle Let us too. remember that. <laughs> you know, but uh, what I, I'd like to hear, and what you don't seem to hear from the Pope or the Catholic Church, is more criticism of Cuba. I mean, you're going to Cuba. It's still a spy state. It's still, by and large, a gulag. And I just don't hear the Holy See talking about that that much, and I don't know why. Well, I think that's going to be a challenge for him. I think it's going to be a challenge to go down there. He helped uh, uh, broker some of those re improved relations between the Obama administration and the Cuban government, and he is someone who has represented the oppressed. As you said, he was the Archbishop of the slums. Mm -hmm. 
Berta Soler and the ladies in white are being repressed by this government. I don't see how the Pope can maintain his moral authority and not stand with the dissidents and the people who are oppressed uh, against the oppressors and the Cuban government. I think you're really between a rock and a hard place here in terms of how do you assist and aid the people uh, and not bolster an oppressive regime. So I think that if the Pope can use appeals to higher ground, to motivate disparate entities to find common ground and, and try to create a better way of life for people in the, in the country of Cuba, then I think that uh, that's a great thing. Well, yeah. Do you think he's going to do it? That's the question. I think so. That's exactly I mean, what the Archbishop yeah, said. Yeah, I, I think so. And, and at, at the least, uh, he can create a, 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 a staging area for some, for some great dialogue. And, uh, and I know that the releasing of the prisoners is probably a lot of window dressing, but I'd like to see the state of Florida uh, at least uh, restore voting rights uh, to 1.6 million uh, uh, former felons who have paid their debt to society but still can't vote. So I think that that's a good precedent that I'd like to see the United States follow. It's going to be very interesting, um, Glenn, in how he uses his spiritual power, right? There's a lot of stuff that you're going to see publicly and stuff that happens behind the scenes, right? Justin, you've seen him work this whole diplomatic um, um, recourse and journey with Cuba behind the scenes. And so that that was completely behind the scenes absolutely. for a year In and the half sacristy, back in the sanctuary, you know, right. he's working. We have a political crowd here this morning, so I want to get to a little politics. And, you know, not the most important politics of the week, but certainly the most talked about was Jeb Bush opening up Stephen Colbert's show. And for anyone who missed it, here's a little sample of it. I will build a wall between the United States and Iran and make Mexico pay for it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Trucks, trucks are strong. I will turn the National Mall into a luxury golf course, and China will respect that. I promise to put meatloaf on the $10 bill and give little John a cabinet position, which would send the message that this great nation will never turn down for what? <laughs> but he's, okay, Justin, you worked with Jeb Bush. He's a funny guy, wow. What, tell me, tell me what you think of that tact. Well, I mean, look, that's, uh, that's become, I think, de rigueur for a lot of the presidential candidates. Uh, remember Bill Clinton going on the Arsenio Hall television show back in 1992? Saxophone. We saw uh, Hillary Clinton go on the Ellen DeGeneres show uh, this week. Uh, Governor Bush earlier did Jimmy Fallon. Uh, Stephen Colbert now is doing a late night show. So I think a lot of politicians, a lot of people who are candidates running for office, uh, it gives them an opportunity to kind of show a different side that you don't typically see when you're being interviewed by the chief political affairs correspondent for the New York Times or CBS News or Face the Nation or things like that. But you know what was really interesting about that? Stephen Colbert asked him how, the, the question every journalist probably at this table as well have, has asked, how is your administration going to be different from your brother George W? And actually got the best answer that I've heard Jeb Bush give, a, a real answer about what he thought Jeb Bush did wrong. He, George. He, uh, George W. Bush um, overspent for a Republican. He was not fiscally conservative. When have you heard that before? Well, he has kind of said that before. Easy for Jeb to say, by the way, because when he was governor, the Florida budget, despite his tax cuts, increased hand over fist as far as spending is concerned. I, I can't remember the exact percentage, but it was a double-digit increase in the eight years, albeit he did govern during an economic boom time, so it's kind of inevitable. But there was a whole boatload of spending that happened when he was governor. And how do you contrast the call for fiscal responsibility with the tax plan that he just released that calls for massive cuts for the wealthiest Americans, 12% for the top income earners, 23% on their interest rates? So how do, I mean, how do you, $3.4 trillion in lost revenue. So how do you uh, maintain a social safety net uh, for the most vulnerable American? And how do you pay for that? Well, what about, uh, well he claims that there's dynamic scoring which is what they call it now, which is his dad used to call voodoo economics. But they claim it'll be only a, a 1.2 trillion revenue loss over 10 years. Possibly the most interesting tax cut in Jeb Bush's tax cut package is how much money it saves Jeb Bush, $800,000 a year. Yeah, but it's also important to keep in mind that we have a very progressive tax policy. If you're going to do tax cuts for everybody, because those people at the top end pay most of the taxes, sure. if you do across the board tax cuts, the benefit is going to fall disproportionately to them. There are other parts of the plan also that raise uh, taxes on the hedge funds who right now don't pay, uh, they don't pay, they pay at the capital gains tax rate for some of the things that they do. They're going to be taxed at ordinary income. And it also removes, it increases the amount of people that can file the simple form and don't have to file the long paperwork form. And a lot of people, by tens of millions. And a 
Go, I'm sorry. A lot of people will get a tax cut, but the difficulty is, is that when you talk about how you're going to rein in the deficit and then propose a tax plan that actually increases deficits, it's just it's this cognitive yeah, dissonance. Yeah, but at the same time, sense. it's going to if you grow the economy, the government will have a lot more money than it has now. Right now, at two percent growth, which is what our economy is growing at right now. That puts a limit on on what the government can do, and it m exacerbates our, our deficits. So if you can get the growth going, you can actually shrink those deficits. But whether it's a debate over fiscal approach, you know, Jeb's um, family connections are going to continue to follow him. Um, his folks who are advising him, let Jeb be Jeb. Let him be himself. You know, that's, the, that's his key. This, at the, at the um, debate that's coming up this week, the, that'll be a great question for the debate. How, for everyone in this on, on that podium, how do you get out from... Donald Trump's shadow in this debate. I mean, that's going to be priority one, no? I don't think you get out from Donald Trump's shadow. Donald Trump is a reality television celebrity. That's who he is. Um, and he's, he, he puts his name on everything that he uh, touches. And that's, that's who he is. I, I think that what you do is you stand your ground. You don't, uh, you don't, uh, you call him out on the fact that he insults people and he thinks that's the way that you can, um, that you can g gain respect and become powerful. And he's also very, very thin skinned. Uh, he can't take a tough question or take any criticism without getting his feelings hurt and lashing out. Calling and someone I think stupid. That, well, yeah, and calling Loser. people names and, <laughs> and making, making derogatory comments about uh, women's appearances, especially a presidential candidate, a former CEO like Harley Fiorina. I think that the other candidates by being presidential they will contrast the fact that Donald Trump may be a reality television star but he's not presidential R real quick uh, before we end this segment and go on to other things I want to get it we let's talk about Bernie Sanders we, we rarely get to talk about Bernie Sanders because we don't see the needle move for him during the week but but he did sort of make news he is making a big push for the African-American vote and uh, last time he was in South Florida talking to an African-American audience I did not see a huge excitement for him Marcus Bright, what do you think about that? Oh, I think that Bern I think number one, he raises a lot of uh, concerns that need just need to be out there in terms of income inequality, criminal justice reform. But at the end of the day, I think a lot of African Americans they want to win the election, mm -hmm. and uh, the criticism or uh, President Obama has been painted to try to undermine him as a socialist. Bernie Sanders is a socialist, and so we don't. I don't necessarily see uh, the path to victory in a general election, uh, which are, which you know, which is the bottom line. All right, let's take a quick break. Um, we have a lot more to talk about when we come back, including Europe's refugee crisis coming to our shores. Stay tuned. The refugee crisis is not uh, just a, a European problem. Uh, it's a world problem, and we have obligations. That we've got to do our part, first of all, in taking our share of refugees. And those of you who saw some of these heartbreaking images of uh, that small boy, uh, drowned. I think uh, anybody who's a parent uh, understands uh, that uh, you know that that stirs all of our consciences. Yes, and with that announcement, the president announced that the United States will be taking 10,000 of the Syrian refugees. And all I could think of when the world is watching these heart-wrenching images and having this crisis play out in real time on the national news, do not we know in South Florida so well what a refugee crisis looks like? Very, what is, very, very the, telling, Glenn. What is the U.S. Over. role in this crisis? Well, like the president said, he has an obligation in regards to signing that treaty with the United Nations, certainly. But 10,000 is not enough. It's mm -hmm. just a speck in the in the pool. You know, we have ex we accepted well over 120,000. You know, during the Mario boat lift, we accepted hundreds of thousands from Vietnam. Um, we're the richest nation on earth. We have more than an obligation, and this is what the Pope is definitely going to speak about in regards to having, um, in, in before Congress, and having a moral obligation to act as leader in the world. You know, what was really interesting to me is when that news hit, there is already blowback beginning about people in this country fear, especially with all the talk about terrorism and... Uh, there are people talking about fear of admitting people from the Middle East as refugees to this country. Sure, that's that's understandable, but I think we also have to remember that uh, look at two things. One, look at Germany's approach. Germany and Angela Merkel there, they're, they're accepting them. They understand that immigrants can provide uh, incredible economic vitality. Also look at the fact that someone like Steve Jobs' father, the, the founder of Apple Computer Company, was a Syrian immigrant. My grandmother immigrated to this country from Syria over 100 years ago. So I think that um, there is going to be that blowback, 
but at the same time, we're, we are a nation of immigrants. As much as some people don't like that fact, most of us came here, for, or our ancestors came here from somewhere else. We would be denying our heritage if we didn't accept that. Marcus. Absolutely. I think that at some point we have to appeal to the better angels of our nature, as Lincoln said, and, and, I, I, and, and to, the, to the dissidents, uh, to the Trumps. The next time Trump flies over to New York, he needs to stop at the Statue of Liberty and read the Statue of Liberty where it says, bring me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. We have to live up uh, and really be a nation that embodies those principles. I, I agree, but uh, yeah, as was said in the famous treaty by Reagan, trust but verify, there is a legitimate fear that if we have an, an inadequate immigration monitoring system, and ISIS has already stated they are trying to infiltrate other nations, it is not unreasonable to think that they might try to slip in some bad people. I'm not saying we shouldn't take these folks, but l let's pay attention to what we, we're doing. And also, let's start to look at at what point are we going to have a real discussion about whether there's going to be a coalition of nations to invade Syria. At, w at what point does Saudi Arabia actually get off of its lazy duff and actually do something aside from just bombing Yemen? At what point do the rest of the nations of the Middle East and Europe take responsibility for what's going on to stop the refugee crisis. At what point does the United Nations do what it's supposed to do? Yeah, well, this is, this it's, is it's, it's turning into the League of Nations from 1914. Well, it's, it's very complicated. Occupying a sovereign nation is very, something that's very, very complicated to do. Sure. And I, you know, if you, get, if you can get the United Nations or any type of NATO alliance or any type of alliance, a coalition, to agree on that, good luck. I don't, I don't see that how happening. How come no one's even raising it? How come no one's even trying to do it? Because I think it's so, it's so complicated an issue with all the, the strife and the war war between the Shia and the Sunni and all the different factions. I mean, sometimes we don't even know, the U.S. government doesn't even know which side we're on because the enemy of the enemy is still our enemy. Yeah, but at a certain point, though, if we just continue to incentivize folks to be brutalized and forced out of their nations and create a refugee crisis in the rest of the world, that's a problem. I agree. No one's talking about it. This might be a good place to bring up the Iran nuclear deal, a nice segue. Um, it looks like the events in uh, Washington this week, it looks like it's going to be a go. And last week uh, on this program, right before this program, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, all eyes in South Florida were on her. Her decision cast her what she called most consequential vote in support. Not a huge surprise, but I want to put up on our screen uh, for people in South Florida to see how the lawmakers in South Florida voted on the deal. Immediate response to Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the DNC chair, uh, but a uh, congresswoman of a largely Jewish constituency, how she voted. There was a talk, Mark, I think you reported in Politico, people looking to run someone against her in the Democratic primary now, which is boy, unheard of, I think, in, in my lifetime reporting in this town. That might be the only way to beat Wasserman Schultz. It's a very Democratic district. That, that potential candidate is Martin Karp, who's a Miami-Dade school board member. And, well, we talked to Martin Karp, and, and I didn't get the feeling he was gung-ho about running. Well, he's probably going to wind up running into a wood chipper if he does. So it, uh, I wouldn't really advise anyone to do it, but uh, good luck. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> this is true. Yeah, but that, Iran, Fargo. Right. that Iran deal does you know, speak to the issue of this um, Syrian refugee crisis as well. It's very, very complex. Um, but was certainly um, the president is finding his way how to navigate Congress <laughs> with, the, uh, with the Republicans being in charge of the Senate and the House. Um, but it's a little bit messy. Um, he's going to have some more work to do in regards to building some more relationships across the aisle to, to walk us through this transition. And the bottom, the bottom line is that this is, oh, President Obama sees this as his foreign policy legacy. And he put a lot of Democrats who have been traditional staunch uh, defenders and allies of Israel in a very, very difficult position. And Debbie Wasserman Schultz is, is probably, you know, example A of yeah. that. Yeah, but you know, there, it's, you're right, it's so complex and the arguments for and against where the U.S. is concerned are so compelling on both sides. And, and it, it's really difficult for someone to wrap their head around the potential consequences. Well, yeah, I, I'm sorry. Since I just ripped on Saudi Arabia and the Arab nations, I'd also like to say I'm really sick of Benjamin Netanyahu, and a, a guy from Israel who comes over to our country, and despite us giving him money and kind of destabilizes our president, I haven't been a big supporter of this president. I've said a lot of critical things about him on this show and when I write, but you know, Israel's role in uh, kind of fomenting dissent in this country is kind of an unspoken story in regards to this Iran deal. I, I'd met recently with uh, Britain's consulate here, and he explained quite well, like every other nation basically supports this. This is probably the best deal we have. 
and yet we don't hear enough about that. And, and I think the argument is if the United States does not participate in the deal, the deal goes anyway and we lose standing. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, listen, we have to decide, do we want peace or conflict? What kind of environment are we creating in the whole world order of geopolitical um, balance? You know, do we want peace or conflict? And when you hear this rhetoric coming out of the Middle East, yes, we want Israel to be secure. Peaceful. But, it's real peaceful. but Iran there. doesn't. Right. Let's not forget that. But, but that's exactly term, right. But long term, it's really also a problem of nuclear proliferation. We that's a that's the problem that we're dealing with. There are many nations that want to get nuclear weapons. How do you stop it? Do you do it militarily or do you do it through negotiations? That's the challenge. All good mm -hmm. questions. We will attempt to talk about more as the weeks go on. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming in on the Sunday morning. Great. Thanks coming up. Us. You will not see Goodwill nor Salvation Army collection bins in the town of Davie. Jeff Weinseer questions the mayor about that and what's become a controversial decision. Stay tuned. In one South Florida city, nonprofit organizations that depend on clothing donations were ordered to remove all the collection bins. Why? City leaders brought in a for profit company to take over. Jeff Weinsier went to question those apparently capitalizing on the goodwill of residents. We talked to the Salvation Army, and they said they're losing $250,000 a year. Does that bother you? I I don't know that. I, I haven't heard that figure from them, so. Well, I'm telling you. I know, but. You don't believe me? I would have, I'd like to see it in writing. But Davy Mayor Judy Paul knew exactly what the financial hit could be for the Salvation Army if her town ordered the nonprofit to remove these four clothing donation boxes out of Davy. She and other town council members were told during a February 4th meeting. We generated 256000 from those four boxes last year. Only after we pressed on was there some concern on the mayor's part about the Salvation Army's financial hit. So if you saw it in writing. And then, then it would give me, might give me a little bit of concern and maybe we'd try to work something else out. But it's a done deal. There's nothing they can do about it now. That is because the town of Davie recently approved a new agreement with a for-profit company. And that one for-profit company is now the only ones who can put these clothing donation bins in Davie. I believe it's a danger to charities. Nonprofit organizations had to remove their bins from Davie. Goodwill had to remove three donation trailers, including one that had been here at 114th Avenue and State Road 84 for 25 years. At a February meeting, before the decision was made, representatives from Goodwill begged Davy leaders to allow their donation trailers to stay. We think there's clearly room in this great town of Davy to have Goodwill operate and also operate your new textile uh, recycling programs. We're looking for ways where we can coexist. You, you don't want to be the town where, where generosity is discouraged. But they couldn't persuade the town council. All of these new collection bins and trucks have the town's logo. In fine print, the words, this is not a charity, items are not tax deductible, and support a for-profit recycling business. Some say the town of Davie actually has their hands inside these bins. That is because that private company they're now doing business with will pay the town $100,000 a year for the exclusive rights. That's money the town didn't get from others in the past. It's money that will go into the town's own endowment fund. And the town plans on giving that money to charities of their choice. The endowment has been going down and down and down, and we were running out of money. Was any thought given to the effect that this may have on uh, the Salvation Army and Goodwill? Yes, we considered it. I don't think the impact in one community would be detrimental, and I think the focus should be on how this program in Davie is helping Davy Charities. It's very, been very devastating. The Salvation Army says 60% of their income to run programs comes from your clothing donations. And they get no outside help. If there was a hurricane, tornado, or whatever, the Salvation Army would be right there. We're looking at the, those things that specifically benefit Davy residents. Okay.
Okay, but go. when things when things go when things the happen. mayor didn't want to answer any more questions on the subject. They feel like the Davie, town of Davies turned their back it has been. Well, if other towns do the same, then uh, we may be having to pack it up and close the door. In Davie, Jeff Weinseer, Local 10 News. The town of Davie, Davie continues to allow Goodwill and the Salvation Army to do home pickups. That private company has now placed 40 clothing donation bins around Davie and say they may add more. Up next, what does it take to shock the senses? Would a murder a day do it? A state of emergency on our streets is next. Some clouds forming from our Fort Lauderdale cam. That's obvious. Here's weather authority meteorologist Jennifer Correa with the Sunday forecast for you. Hi, Hi Glenna. Hi, how are you? Yes, it looks beautiful out east, but facing towards the west, a lot more cloud cover there. And I'll get to the radar in just a second, but take a look at these temperatures warming up already 90 degrees across a much Broward, northern Miami-Dade. And a look at the radar zooming in into Miami-Dade. There was some rainfall that has already diminished over Doral, but another shower developing over Weston and southwest ranches. More on the way to come. These spotty showers and thunderstorms will develop from the west, push on towards the east. And it's again all ahead of that cold front that's bringing in that southwest flow and that will continue on for the rest of today. But by tomorrow, we'll start seeing that east flow returning. There'll be showers on the breeze Monday and then Tuesday. A lot of moisture over us, allowing for more showers and thunderstorms. But once again, we'll continue with those highs in the low 90s and then rain chances go down by the end of the week. Jennifer, thanks. It's been a while, but if you were around for the aftermath of Hurricane Andrew, you may remember an emergency management director's defining question as South Dade descended into a state of emergency. She implored, where is the cavalry? It's time to ask that question again for another state of emergency. The daily shootings, violence with guns, a young person murdered every day this week in this community. That can only be called a state of emergency. I want everyone to know who's out there who has a son, daughter, mother, father, sister, brother. Love them every day. That is Randall Robinson's mother. Randall is the most recent of three young people from just one high school shot, killed this week. Just being outside, just like that. Day after day, another parent was suddenly paralyzed by the shock and grief of losing their child to violence. And that was just this week. Mass murders at schools in other cities shock our senses. That is happening in slow motion right here. Where is the cavalry? The police, politicians, churches, schools, parents, the pundits who swoop in for the high profile photo ops. It's time to acknowledge it isn't working or not working fast enough. Chronic crime is a symptom of community illness. Low expectations, life devalued, feeling of powerlessness until a weapon provides the power. The link between poverty and violent crime is documented and clear. Solutions and resources are not so clear, but must be a wholesale priority. So where is that cavalry? And how many more mothers will look into the camera and bear their grief, thinking maybe I can be the one to get through? What do you think? We invite you to weigh in on any topic you like. Email, Facebook, Twitter. Here are some of the addresses. We are very easy to find. We thank you for joining us this morning. Michael is back next week. Happy game day.